After the failure of the Canadian 2nd Division to drive the Germans completely out of Hoge Heide and from the Beveland Isthmus, they planned a new attack codenamed Angus. The plan was to attack in the lowlands west of Woensdrecht from a junction nicknamed the Five Roads, towards a crossing on the railway dam which was the first objective, followed by a dash towards the freeway road junction, the second objective, and a final assault on the railway station of Woensdrecht, the third objective. This move would not only completely cut all rail and road links to the Beveland Isthmus in the west, but it would also jeopardize the German position at Hoge Heide and Woensdrecht in the east. The vital German supply road from the north would be exposed to Canadian attack and the German forces would be compelled to retreat. This would in turn allow the Canadians to advance undisturbed into Zeeland and open the sea lane to the vital port of Antwerp. In order to prepare for this attack, the Canadians shuffled their troops. The Royal Regiment of Canada would stay in the lowlands. In Hogerheide, the Calgary Highlanders were relieved by the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry, while the Black Watch of Canada was relieved by the Essex Scottish Regiment. The South Saskatchewan Regiment was also moved up to protect the eastern flank. While the Canadians were rearranging their troops, the Germans did the same. The 1st Battalion of the 2nd Parachute Infantry Regiment, better known as Bataillon Finzel, moved to face the threat of a Canadian attack to outflank the German defences at Hoge Heide. In this context, we should bear in mind that the Wunstrecht airfield also formed a formidable obstacle, because it was previously already secured with barbed wire, trenches, pillboxes and minefields. The airfield in the east and the flooded lowlands in the west formed a funnel of a little over 2 kilometers, through which the Canadians had to advance. In the lowlands the situation was similar, with an even narrower corridor. These geographical constraints largely explain the disposition of von der Heide's battalions. The 3rd battalion sealed off the corridor through the high ground at Hoge Heide, while the 1st battalion was stationed in the lowlands to fend off any attack from that direction. Vigan's 16th company in the lowlands moved back to reserve. So far the 4th battalion had acted as a reserve of von der Heide's regiment and was not committed to the front line. Even on a tactical level, the German defense was sophisticated to exploit the terrain features to maximum effect. In the lowlands, the 1st battalion used the railway embankment and the dikes separating the polders as ramparts, which also gave them the high ground. Coupled with a field of fire in the polder which was devoid of obstacles, this was an almost unassailable position. Last episode we already saw how a company of Fischermjäger almost single-handedly fought off a Canadian battalion. Despite this failure, the Canadian command thought that the advantages of success of Operation Angus outweighed any risk involved. In order to confuse the Germans, diversionary attacks were planned in the direction of Huyberge, Woensdrecht and Zandvoort. The diversionary attacks on Woensdrecht and Zandvoort were however called off at the last moment because the commander of the Royal Hamiltons managed to persuade his superior that his troops needed one day of respite. The Royal Regiment of Canada also didn't play an active role and was left in the lowlands to shield the arrival of the Black Watch of Canada, which was earmarked for the execution of Operation Angus. In the early morning of October 13th, the Canadians opened an artillery barrage to cover the advance of their infantry, but the Vanguard Sea Company arrived too late at the jump off position to benefit from the artillery support. The relative darkness before dawn gave the Canadians still some semblance of cover and they dashed over the dike towards objective Angus 1. The company 
came however quickly under fire from all directions, and in no time it had dozens of casualties. At 7 o'clock, B Company was sent in to give a new impetus to the attack, and the mortars supported them in an effort to suppress the German machine guns. This was however a game that the Germans also could play, and they mortared the Canadians in return, and sprayed them with machine gun fire for good measure. The Canadians were slaughtered in the polder, and soon most officers were either dead or wounded. By 9 o'clock, decimated companies had retreated back to the start line. So far, the Canadian attack had been a complete failure, and they didn't manage to reach any of their objectives. Brigadier Megal of the Canadian 5th Brigade personally went to the front line to inform himself of the disastrous situation. Based on his own assessment, he decided to call in the support of the Air Force and flame-throwing carriers to resume the attack with fresh troops in the afternoon. Around noon, British aircraft bombarded the German front line around the railway dam, and one hour later, Angus III was bombarded as well. At 3 o'clock, Angus III was bombarded again in anticipation of the new Canadian attack. In order to suppress the German machine guns, the artillery pounded once more the German positions, after which the brand carriers with flamethrowers were unleashed on the German positions. They sprayed their flames along the dikes in the last preparation phase before the infantry attack. After the aerial and artillery bombardment, the flamethrowers were expected to break whatever will to fight was left in the German paratroopers. The A and T Company of the Black Watch were moved in position for the final attack that day around 6 o'clock. The goal of this attack was scaled back from reaching Angus 3 to reaching Angus 1. But even that goal was far too optimistic. As soon as the two companies moved out, they came under fire from the Feischenjäger. The companies became stuck on both sides of the dike towards the railway dam, unable to move forward or backward. The Feischenjäger had been hiding in their foxholes behind the dikes and came out on top of the dike to fire on the exposed Canadians with devastating effect. It was not until darkness fell that the Canadians had the opportunity to collect their wounded and evacuate their survivors. Friday, October 13th had been truly a day of misfortune for the Black Watch. To assess the severity of the Canadian losses, we need to have a look at the composition of the Canadian forces. An average Canadian infantry battalion had an official establishment of 850 men, of which 500 were in the frontline companies. On the eve of the fateful Friday in October, these companies were already seriously below establishment strength, altogether barely half of the overall frontline strength. After the failed attack on October 13th, the companies were completely decimated. A Company was down to 9 men, B Company was halved, C Company was brought back to a couple of dozen men, and D Company was even worse off. This meant that the overall frontline strength was down to less than 100 men. The Black Watch would receive 150 replacements, but these were combed out from the rear area services and needed to be retrained as infantry first before any commitment. Basically, the Black Watch needed to be rebuilt as a battalion and would not see serious action until February 1945. By contrast, the Faschenjäger had suffered only one fatality. The Canadians had underestimated the enemy and had suffered terrible losses as a result. It would, however, not be the last time they would suffer at the hands of the German paratroopers of the 6th Regiment.